I'll give AEW credit for this, is that they have fewer big shows in terms of pay-per-view. You know, for years, common complaint, understandably so, because I've shared it, is WWE has all these pay-per-views. It's too damn much. Too many of their pay-per-views just don't matter. And even with going to the WWE Network and eventually Peacock, it only made the problem worse, not better. Because now you're trying to justify a $10 or $5 price point per show, basically, as opposed to a $40, $45, $50 plus dollar price point. It's much different. I like how AEW only has a few of these truly big shows. And, and you have to make sure that you deliver the goods if you're going to charge $50 for a damn show. I can make the argument that there's some type of happy middle ground where they could throw in a couple of more pay-per-views, maybe chop the price a little bit and help the flow of their weekly television programming. I think six to seven, maybe eight pay-per-views would be the happy media. Maybe you charge more like $35 to $40 instead of $50. I, I could get down with that. Um, but it puts a lot of pressure on them at the same time to have to produce great shows. You have to justify that high price point. And I certainly will say, with full gear, they did just that. This show was very good, with some key flaws that need to be called out. Uh, those key flaws being, number one, just because every match can go 15 to 20 minutes, and you can go that long with your show, it doesn't mean you should. Just because you start at 8 p.m. Eastern on Saturday, doesn't mean you need to start that show at 8 and run it till midnight. If you insist on having a four hour show, start it at 7 Eastern. Otherwise, figure out a way to say we can do a little less. Because pacing can and needs to be a little bit better, and it was a problem on this show. You got fans basically blowing all their emotions, all of their wad at the very beginning, which is kind of missing the plot because at the end of the day, this show was truly, and I don't care, you were looking forward to other matches, I was too. But this show was about one match, one wrestler, and one moment. And that was the main event, Hangman Page, and whether or not he was going to win the AEW World Championship. You have to understand that going in. Nothing else matters by comparison. The other stuff is important, yes. But it all has to feed into the moment that is supposed to serve as the crescendo of everything. And the reality is, if you do too much shit too early, you will burn out your crowd. And you saw that, especially with the second half of Full Gear. Sometimes less is more. Not every match needs to be 20, 25 damn minutes. Not everybody needs to get 300 levels of bullshit in. And I think if I look at Full Gear, if you trim some of the fat, got a match or two off of this card, and you really got crisp on what you did with the matches that you have, and had it be a three hour show, We'd probably be talking about this being AEW's greatest pay-per-view to date. Some people are probably still going to say that. I don't concur or agree, but it was a pretty good show. But these are things that I hope Tony Khan and this company figure out how to do better. Because four hours, nah. You didn't have four hours worth of content here. You just didn't. And when I talk about the pacing problem, I look at the opener. MJF versus Darby Allen. This match was outstanding. The storytelling involved between both of these guys... You know, it was interesting to hear MJF getting some pro MJF chance. That was interesting. It tells you that someday there is the potential that you could flip him babyface and it really works, but certainly that time has not come now. But the problem with this match is it was almost too good for that curtain jerker spot. Like one of those foul that type of matches. And how the hell are you going to foul this? Like if you want to point to two, these two guys being two of the pillars of AEW, this is a match that showed why both of them would be pillars of the company. Problem is, they're two pillars of the company and you have them in the curtain jerker spot. This would have been really great to have maybe middle of the card. Like you want to have a good solid opener, yes. You need something in the middle that's great with some spacing, then main event. Putting this here in the opener, like really put some undue pressure on the subsequent matches and, you know, risk blowing the wad of the audience right away. And you look at the second match, FTR versus the Lucha Bros. My crowd was kind of into it, but not nearly the same as the opener. And I'm glad 
that they, at one point in time when they were doing the crowd counts a long spot and they were doing it in Espanol, I'm glad they stopped counting at Ocho because knowing they were in fucking Minneapolis, they certainly can't count to 10 in Espanol or English. So there you go. The match was good, but honestly, it felt like, really, it was a great dynamite main event that was just kind of shoehorned in here on the second match on the show. And this is another example to me where sometimes less is more. When he got to the spot of doing the Eddie tribute, like FTR started it and the crowds got all types of heat on FTR, then you've got the Lucha Brothers and they're doing the Three Amigos tributes and the Frog Splash. Like, that's it. That's the match. Fiend. Over. Stop. Go home. Because nothing you're going to do is going to top that. And unfortunately, they went too long, went a few more minutes, and they came up with this contrived-ass, stupid-ass switch mask finish, which was really fucking stupid. Like, you're going to sit there and have... Was it Wheeler wearing the mask, but Dash was the legal one? Who gives a fucking shit? Like, you sat there and did that. He's not the legal guy, but then he gets pinned. You immediately take off his mask, so you reveal it's the wrong guy. Like, what the fuck is the ref doing here? Why in the hell wouldn't he reverse decision and restart the match? He knew, he knows now it wasn't the legal dude. This is kind of fitting for what has been a lackluster ass, lackluster and totally ass tag team title reign by the Lucha Bros so far. Like, if it was going to be like this, you should have put it on Jurassic Express. Or even worse, if it was going to be like this, you might as well kept it on the fucking Bucks to suck. This could have been better. Should have went home with the Eddie spot and the Eddie tribute. The mask finish was fucking stupid. Miro versus Brian Danielson. I can picture it now, backstage. Miro going to Dan Brian Danielson and saying, you know, how about we put me over like Big Monster? And Brian Danielson says, uh, that's not going to work for me, brother. And then when Tony Khan comes to him along with Miro and says, hey, Brian, I, I know you're a big deal and all, but we really feel like it's a good idea to put the monster Miro over here so that way he could be the first opponent for Hangman Page. And Brian Danielson goes, that doesn't work for me, brother. <laughs> like, the match itself was really, really good. Don't get me wrong here. You, I love some of the way they worked in, like Daniel Bryan would get in three clean shots because Miro encouraged him with this kicks to the ribs, but Miro would drop Dan Bryan Danielson after one kick to his ribs. Like, that's a way to let, you know, letting Daniel, Bryan Danielson, I keep saying, wanting to say Daniel Bryan, Bryan Danielson get his shit in, but at the same point in time, you're doing enough to let Miro look legit. The only concern I have about this is you just had Miro lose to a much smaller guy in Sammy Guevara. Now he's turning around and losing in this spot to a much smaller Brian Danielson. No size does not always matter, but when you're building somebody up like a monster, you have to pick and choose your spots where you have them lose to guys that are significantly smaller than them. I'm not saying it doesn't work here, I'm just saying you have to be careful. But Brian Danielson wins, and to me, the only solution is he should be coming out and immediately seeking that title opportunity on Wednesday. Let's go big and go home, bitches! The Falls Count Anywhere match, the Elite versus the Jurassic Express and Christian. With the stipulation involved, the story, the fact there was actually story between Jungle Boy and Adam Cole, between the Elite and Jurassic Express and Christian. Like, there was actually storyline heading into this. It's a Falls Count Anywhere match. It merited the stipulation that it had. So when I look at this, that you had a story leading into it, a stipulation that made sense to some degree, I look at it and say, these matches that the Bucks of Suck are involved in are infinitely less annoying to me. Because when they're doing all their random fucking shit, you know, like, good. That's the type of match you're supposed to have here. This is when it's supposed to be balls to the walls. And you even had storytelling during the match where Jungle Boy doesn't want to do the concerto, doesn't want to do the concerto. And then you get build up to your big finish where he absolutely hits one of the bucks of suck with the concerto. And it's Fiend, good night. Right after Luchasaurus sits there and does a shooting star press off the ramp. I guess it annoys me a little bit that Jungle Boy's always got to be the one to get the shine here. Like you can't hear the fans chanting for the Luchasaurus. You can't see how unique and interesting this fucking gimmick is. You can't see the star potential in him. You can't see how some of that star potential of Jungle Boy is tied into Luchasaurus? 
Like, it's a shame that this match wasn't for the fucking tag team titles, which is what the hell it should have been, because, man, this would have been a real banger if it was. But it was still a really good match. Some of you are going to say it was a little long. It took a little too long at the finish, and I get that. But, frankly, the Luchasaurus shooting star press sustained me for the last few minutes. But I've always been a sucker for having story going into it, story during the match, stipulations that make sense, and this match had it, so I did enjoy it. So the first half of this card... There wasn't a bad match. They were all good matches. You know, the tag team title match was easily the worst of the two tag matches on the first half of the show and didn't really belong in this pay-per-view and the finish was really stupid, but I digress. But then we really started to lose the plot because I'm looking at these first four matches and I said, holy shit, A, this shit is look, stacking up to be a fantastic show. B, they better hope they didn't blow all their wad now. And then it started to unravel a little bit. Cody and pa Pac versus Andrade and Malachi Black. I, I swear, Cody should have just come out in a fucking lowrider. Everybody else doing the Eddie Guerrero tributes. Like, go in a different direction, Homelander. Like, stop fucking fighting against it, Cody Cena. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, come out in a lowrider. Go all the way, damn it. Uh, but this match, yeah, it wasn't needed on this pay-per-view. I know this is Cody Cena trying to get his... Uh, pay-per-view payout from AEW, but this should have been a Dynamite or Rampage main event and everybody would have been all the wiser for it and better for it and would have made either an episode of Dynamite or Rampage that much better for its inclusion. Here, this is an example where I talk about sometimes less is more. Trim the fat a little bit. If you don't need the match, don't have the match. You did not need to have this match on this damn car. You just didn't. The AEW Women's Championship, Ty Conti versus Britt Baker. Number one, I do want to point out here. I call her Ty Conti, but sometimes say Tay Conti. But then I hear JR is calling her Tay Conti. Tay has it, and others are calling her Ty Conti. Then later on, Jim Ross is calling her Ty Conti. Like, can we make up how we're supposed to say her name? It might help her actually get over more if everybody knows who the fuck you're referring to commonly, consistently, every single time. I'll say this. This was a really good showcase for Ty Conti's skills. No question. She looked great, both physically and in terms of some of the stuff that she did. It was, in theory, a good match. But this match did not need to go over 15 minutes. And at no point in time did I actually believe that Dr. Britt Baker was going to lose this match. Like, there is something about a great match gets you sucked in and gets you to buy in and emotionally believe that it can happen. At no point in time in this match did I think that Conti was actually going to win this title. It's about five to seven minutes too goddamn long and not because it's the women. At least I'm saying, unlike the Cody tag match, which didn't belong in this card, at least I'm saying here, this belonged in this card, but you could have done less with, could have done less, could have done more with less. Trim the fat. Would have helped here. Thankfully, it was followed up by Eddie Kingston and CM Punk, and this was fucking fantastic. I would argue the shortest match of the night may very well have truly been the best match of the night. Now, certainly you're going to have those that are going to point to other matches like MJF and Darby Allin, and that match was great. I would agree, like if I was going to point to a true match of the night from beginning to end, that might be it. But others are going to point to the other spot fests that were sprinkled in throughout this card. But to me, Eddie Kingston versus CM Punk was the match that most closely stuck to the plot, got its purpose, got its point, understood its role, and fucking delivered. Eddie Kingston leading into this said he didn't care whether he beat CM Punk or not. He wanted to beat him the hell up, and that's exactly what the hell happened. I don't know what the hell was up with the soccer-playing, umbro-looking CM Punk chugs, but what fucking ever. But... Even before the damn match started, Eddie Kingston's getting in a good clean shot on CM Punk and knocking him out. And they were balls to the walls beginning to end. 10, 11 minutes, short, sweet, to the point. CM Punk wins. Everybody's better for it. Get the fuck out of Dodge. Like the crowd, even though they were cooked, they were hot for this. Because you had two characters that the people were invested in. Two characters they gave a shit about. With a story that made sense that people gave a shit about. You see where sometimes less is more. Yes, it was brutal and had some extreme stuff. And that is fine because the story and the storyline and the participants necessitated that. And this was fantastic. It absolutely was. And most importantly of all, it leaves a reason for a return match. 
and it leaves me wanting a return match. That, to me, is a great match right there. Which I can't, unfortunately, say about this street fight between the Inner Circle and America's top team. It's a Minneapolis street fight. So we're going to throw in a bunch of irrelevant references about the toaster being invented there and the fucking water ski and the hockey stick and ah, the toaster. The toaster! Jake Hager, what's the toaster? Oh, God. This was dull. The crowd was already sat by now. So was I. And it showed. And these guys did a bunch of crap. And there was storyline here. And there was absolutely reason I was necessitated to do this. But it just didn't work. And sometimes that's just the way it goes. The MMA dudes were all right. I mean, I know at one point you, had, you could hear Jericho yelling, Junior! Junior! Trying to get him to interfere. Like, you know, this is a new spot for them so they don't get the timing and execution of some of these key things. It's going to happen. Um, they were a little sloppy. You could tell kind of unsure of themselves. But you do the best you can, and they did some okay stuff. Um, you know, but this whole match was all coming down to Dan Lambert and Chris Jericho and Chris Jericho getting one up on Dan Lambert. That's all that was going to matter. We know that's what it was. But again, when I look at this show, this is an example here where while the match was technically justified, that it was deserving of being on the pay-per-view, and it absolutely was, I also say, would it have been better off on Dynamite or Rampage? Give it 20 minutes, fans aren't as cooked. Like you can really emphasize the heat that's been built up here. You can put it in front of many more viewers by putting it on your TV show. Again, an example of less is more. Because you took something that had great buildup and kind of produced a doo-doo match that people didn't really care about. But I think at this point in time, so certainly I was, it was past 11 o'clock Easter, I'm like, let's get to the fucking point here, because there's only one match, one moment, and one man that matters tonight, and that is Hangman Adam Page. AEW World Championship, Hangman Adam Page versus Kenny Omega. They did it, they had him ride in on the horse with the pre-taped, you know, animation, that looked great. Wish he would have rode it into the frickin' arena, but I understand why you didn't do that. But... Only three things, I tweeted this at, at the beginning of the match, only three things ultimately mattered here. It was going to be the Don Callis bump, the buckshot lariat, one, two, three. Everything else was just finger fucking and window dressing until you got to that. Those were the three things that mattered. As long as they resulted in Hangman Adam Page becoming the new AEW World Champion. Now you have dipshits out there like Bully Ray that said, well, you can't do it now. Like... All, everything pointed to this moment being the right time. This is the hottest Hangman Page has ever been. Cowboys shit all effing day. He lost the first ever, you know, world title match for AEW's top title when he lost to Chris Jericho. Remember that? Full Gear 2020. He lost to Kenny Omega in the finals of that Eliminator Tournament match, which is the spot where Omega won and got his shot later to beat Moxley for the AEW World Championship. Like, the history between him and Omega, like, you have to fucking do it here. If you don't now, when? And if you don't now, why fucking bother? And why would the fans bother? It was a shame that the crowd was kind of cooked by this point. Well, they were pretty cooked. But they certainly came to life when they saw Hangman Page. It's just a problem of, like, you're asking the fans to do a lot to be invested in a 25-plus minute match here. Although these two guys did go out there and tell a pretty good, compelling, interesting story. Like, even the moments where you have Hangman Page talking about, Is that the best you got, motherfucker? Like, love it! And I totally get and understand and appreciate what they were aiming for here when they had Matt Nick Jackson walk out to the ring towards the end of the match. I totally get it. You already had the callus bump. That was step one. I had to get him out of the way. Now you've got the thing of, hey, the Young Bucks, when, Ome when Omega and Paige had their beef before, Paige asked them to be on their his side. They weren't. Now they come out, and this time they don't have Omega's back. They support Hangman Paige, and they acknowledge him. Acknowledge him! And they're not going to interfere. And they recognize and respect him and recognize and realize the moment at hand. I totally get when you're planning this, this is like great long-term storytelling. 
I totally understand and get when you're planning this. You're like, man, our fans are really going to connect with this. Like, this is going to carry some weight. This is going to have some additional power and meaning behind it before you get to that ultimate moment of Buckshot Lariat, one, two, three, yay, Hangman Page is the new AEW World Champion. So I absolutely am not criticizing the decision to do it because on paper, it makes so much fucking sense. And yet in still... When it comes down to brass tacks, when they did it, it just didn't work. It didn't work. Like, it really didn't work. If anything, it was distracting and took away from the finish of the match. Like you have this and you have this realization, then it's bam, Buckshot Larry at one, two, three, it's over. So I'm not criticizing the thought process and the decision making here. Because fundamentally, it was absolutely the right thing to do. But you have to call out at the end of the day, it's a results driven industry, a results driven business. And the result was that it was bad and it didn't work and it distracted away from the moment. And with all that being said, it don't fucking matter because the 100% right thing to do was to have Hangman Adam Page win this title on Saturday night at full gear, 100% clean over Kenny Omega, one, two, three in the damn ring. And that's exactly what the fuck they did. No overthinking it, minus the bucks coming out, but I get that part. No trying to get cute, no we're going to swerve the crowd, no any of that bullshit. Recognizing that the moment was at hand, the time had come. If you don't do it now, when? And if you don't do it now, why ever bother? And obviously the fans were elated. Was the pop as loud and as intense as I would have anticipated? After a drawn out four hour show? Yeah, probably. If it was three hours, man, that crowd would have absolutely lost their shit and totally came unglued. Because this has been a, a two plus year pursuit for Hangman Adam Page. And it's a shame that it didn't quite come across like that, but it was still a really awesome moment. It was well done. You have the Dark Order come out instead of having the drink. He wants to have a hug because they're going to hug it out. Like that shit really worked. So the most important thing of all on this night was that Hangman Page walked out of Full Gear, the AEW World Champion, and be made to look good in the process. And both of those things happened. It was a really good show. It's just some of you will be uncomfortable with the fact that I still criticize some things about this show. And you know what the reality is? That's your problem, not mine. If you can't accept that while things can be really good in a relentless pursuit of perfection, you can still have areas that are weaknesses, areas that are flaws, problems to solve. And that's your own insecurities, not mine. You can absolutely point to this being a really good show, easily worth the $50 spent, like I'm doing right now, and point out that, man, they were close to truly having an all-timer. And they were. Trim off some of the fat, prioritize some of the right things, ooh-wee, this show could have been something truly special. But at least I will say, you will remember this show if for no other reason, Hangman Page finally becoming AEW World Champion. And that in and of itself makes this show go down in history.